Good evening. I'm Neil Kirksall. Ian is off tonight. The man accused of roaming the grounds of Rideau Hall, armed, is charged. He had several weapons. What we're learning about the Army reservist and his motive. The Prime Minister under investigation. Why did the government award a multi-million dollar contract to a charity with ties to his family? Obviously, the way uh, this situation has unfolded has been uh, unfortunate. A shocking and deadly shooting rampage in Winnipeg. It's so devastating, you know, like just to know that her life was cut short. The targets apparently random. The suspect, just 14 years old. I'll let the bubble begin. I'm very anxious to visit. It's a relief for us. Atlantic Canadians line up to travel. Could the rest of the country be next? I hope not for a while. <laughs> Seriously. This is The National. What motivated the man who allegedly crashed through the gates of Rideau Hall? What did he want as he moved towards the Prime Minister's home? Investigators aren't revealing that yet, but police are making one thing very clear, that the suspect was heavily armed. Canadian Army reservist Corey Huron faces 22 charges tonight, most of them weapons offences. Olivia Stefanovich has what we've learned about Huron and the tense, nearly two-hour effort to calm, contain and arrest him. He had several weapons, several, more than one. The RCMP says Corey Huron carried at least one of those weapons, what appeared to be a rifle, after he allegedly rammed this truck through the gates of Rideau Hall and roamed the grounds. The RCMP engaged in a 90-minute negotiation, which led to his peaceful arrest. There's no risk to the public, and from what we have right now, he's, he was acting alone. Huron, an active Canadian reservist from Manitoba, is facing 22 charges, including possession of a restricted firearm and four counts of having a weapon for a dangerous purpose. This individual has a previous track record with the Canadian Armed Forces, um, and so it suggests a rather curious turn of events. The Canadian Armed Forces says none of Huron's firearms came from the military. The 46-year-old showed off his Ranger patch on social media. He also appears to have dabbled in right-wing conspiracy theories. That justifies an investigation led by the RCMP's National Security Team, or INSET, according to this expert. All we have right now is a few memes and the location of, uh, of Mr. Huron's actions, but I think those uh, do necessitate an investigation by the INSET. Shortly before allegedly storming the grounds of Rideau Hall, a post on an account for Huron's business referred to Event 201, a pandemic preparedness exercise hosted before the global outbreak, proof some say COVID-19 was planned. Whether that motivated Huron, police won't say. The interviews that were conducted, but it's not something I'm going to share. The broken gates at Rideau Hall have been refortified by a concrete barrier, part of additional security measures after Thursday's incident. As for Huron, he will remain in custody until at least his next court date in two weeks. Olivia Stefanovic, CBC News, Ottawa. After much criticism, the federal government is parting ways with the WE charity, the organization selected to run a multi-million dollar student grant program. But the controversy isn't going away. As Catherine Cullen tells us, Justin Trudeau's ties to the charity have now sparked an ethics investigation. Thank you, WE Day, for this warm welcome. These are now the good old days. The Prime Minister has gone from appearing at the WE Charities Youth Leadership events earlier this week defending Wee's role administering a $900 million student service grant program. Quite frankly, uh, when our public servants uh, looked at uh, the potential partners, uh, only the WE, uh, we uh, organization had the capacity to deliver the ambitious program that young people need. To today, fielding questions about how we wouldn't be delivering the program anymore, described as a mutually agreed upon decision. Obviously, the way uh, this situation has unfolded has been uh, unfortunate. It comes after a cascade of questions. The Trudeau's personal connections to WE, revelations most of WE's board of directors had recently resigned or been replaced, questions about the program itself, which amount to students being paid less than minimum wage. In a statement today, WE co-founders Mark and Craig Kielberger said there were good answers to those questions. However, 
Our concern is that to continue in this way, the program itself will begin to suffer and as a consequence, opportunities for students might be negatively affected. Not only would that be unwelcome, it is unnecessary. While we is well connected to students, this industry observer believes the problems came down to frictions with other nonprofits. The charity sector writ large would have much preferred to see more tried and true charities taking the helm of such an expensive program. But the challenges aren't over. The ethics commissioner is now investigating. What can they point to as justification for uh, we being the only group that could do this? Did, did they do an analysis? We'd like to find out this information. As for the 35,000 students who applied for the grant program, the government says it does intend to keep it going, but that things might not work quite as well without we. Catherine Cullen, CBC News, Ottawa. A string of horrific attacks in Winnipeg left one person dead. Now there's been an arrest. The suspect is just 14 years old. Marina von Stackelberg reports. A community grieving, trying to understand how Daniel Don Cote is dead and a 14-year-old is charged with her murder. Like nobody could comprehend and then just finding out like it was a little boy that did it, just, it's awful. In just a little more than 24 hours, Winnipeg police say the teenage boy attacked people in four different locations, apparently at random. Starting early Wednesday morning, a man was shot, then hit by a vehicle. He's in hospital in critical condition. Then police say the teen shot at a man and woman who managed to escape. Less than an hour later, Daniel Doncote and her cousin were walking to get a bag of chips. She was shot dead. He made the decision to go hurt people and take my sister's life. It was so senseless and it was over, like, over, like, stupid stuff. It, my, all my sister wanted to do was just go to the store. It didn't stop there. The next night, a man was stabbed another shot at the Forks, a popular tourist spot. Police have connected all four incidents to the same teenager. We still have numerous witnesses even that we expect to interview. Uh, but the reality is we've, we can acknowledge that uh, we don't believe any of these victims knew their shooter. And that's about as far as we can get in terms of motive at this time. Police say the 14-year-old wasn't known to them, but he had run-ins with the justice system before. They say he used the same gun in all the attacks, including the one that killed Danielle. This is so devastating, you know, like just to know that her life was cut short. The family is holding this vigil tonight with so many questions unanswered. Meanwhile, the boy remains in police custody, facing a slew of charges, including first-degree murder. Marina von Stackelberg, CBC News. Winnipeg. The Transportation Safety Board is investigating a float plane crash in Alberta. It happened this morning in a field 20 kilometers east of Edmonton's airport. Three people were killed. Ottawa is condemning a controversial new security law Beijing imposed on Hong Kong. It's also suspending extradition and military exports. But as Chris Brown explains, there are calls for Canada to do even more. With pro-democracy supporters claiming Hong Kong's very survival is at stake over China's new security law, the Prime Minister today announced Canada's response. Effective immediately, Canada will not permit the export of sensitive military items to Hong Kong. We are also suspending the Canada-Hong Kong extradition treaty and updating our travel advisory for Hong Kong. Critics claim the one country, two systems agreement that preserved Hong Kong's autonomy is effectively dead, since China can now extend its law into the territory. This young man, who we've agreed not to identify, fled here after last summer's protests and is trying to get asylum. I see Hong Kong people, uh, including my friends, they are under uh, fear, they couldn't bear and couldn't imagine before. I'm facing uh, more than five or six years sentence by doing nothing. Suspending extradition now effectively saves him from being turned over to Beijing, says Vancouver immigration lawyer Richard Curland. China can use a, uh, the Hong Kong extradition process to indirectly get at someone who's in Canada who allegedly violates Hong Kong rules, but the Hong Kong rules are set by Beijing. Other Western nations, though, have gone further by making it easier for those who face political persecution to flee. 
And this new Democrat MP says Canada must do the same. At least 400 people have been arrested uh, in Hong Kong with the passage of this law. And so to that end, uh, I think that we need to bring in special measures through our immigration stream. Canada's relationship with China was already frozen over the extradition of Huawei executive and China's capture of the two Michaels in response. And critics here are saying there's now very little to lose by being even more assertive. Chris Brown, CBC News, Vancouver. Seven months of grief fighting for answers. That is the reality for families of the 176 people who died on Ukraine International Airlines Flight 752. Now an Edmonton man says he's also faced threats from the lead investigator. Ashley Burke has this CBC News exclusive. A 91-minute phone call that's hard for Javad Soleimani to listen back to, and even harder to believe he received. It's ridiculous. His wife died when Iran shot down Flight 752 six months ago. Then in March, he got a call from the Iranian official in charge of the investigation. Hassan Rezifar tried to convince him to delete online comments critical of Iran's regime. They just wanted to somehow threaten me to stop criticizing the regime. They are not independent, and they are confessing it. The call alone is unusual, but what's even more surprising is that the investigator made other key admissions. On the call, Rezi Farr suggested Iran didn't close its airspace on that January day because it could have exposed Iran's plans to strike U.S. bases in Iraq. He said, let's say we had cleared the airspace, wouldn't it give away our imminent attack? That's been a key question for victims' families ever since Iran admitted it unintentionally shot the plane on a night of intense military activity. To knowingly put civilian aircraft in harm's way, uh, to use civilian airliners in effect as a, a human shield, uh, clearly implicates uh, criminal responsibility. Experts say the audio is new evidence that shows what analysts suspected all along. This is not a, a, an independent investigation, and it's not surprising in that sense. Canada's advisor into the crash says the investigator's behavior is outrageous. It's simply completely wrong. Uh, and that kind of, uh, of uh, uh, abusive process is, is something that, uh, that we are very concerned about. In another twist, after CBC News emailed a copy of the audio recording to Iran's investigative team for a comment, the lead investigator was removed from his role and replaced. Ashley Burke, CBC News, Ottawa. 20 Saudi officials are now on trial in Turkey. They're charged in the murder of journalist Jamal Khashoggi. The trial in Saudi Arabia could not be given a credibility. The defendants are being tried in absentia. They're, they are not physically in Turkey for these proceedings. Activists, though, hope this trial will help boost the case for sanctions against Saudi Arabia. Several intelligence agencies say the Saudi government is directly responsible for the murder. Hashogji was killed in 2018 inside the Saudi consulate in Istanbul. His remains were never found. We're going to turn back to this country now and COVID-19. The situation here in Canada does look promising, though it is important to remember the first wave isn't entirely behind us. Of the roughly 105,000 cases identified in this country, more than 27,000 are active. The bulk are still in Ontario and Quebec. East of Quebec, the number of active cases is just five. There are a couple in New Brunswick, three in Nova Scotia. So as of today, within a four-province Atlantic bubble, people can now travel without mandatory quarantine. And people who live in those provinces are thrilled about it. Kayla Hounsel shows you what we mean. On Prince Edward Island, the lineups started when the clock struck midnight. By daybreak, they were even longer. We've been in the lineup now for, oh, an hour and 39 minutes. As hundreds tried to make their way into neighboring provinces. Going home to see my mom, haven't seen her since uh, pretty much Christmas, so she's 87. I'm very anxious to visit. COVID-19 travel restrictions have been eased, but the provincial boundaries look more like borders than ever. All travelers are required to show proof of residency, but no one seemed to mind.
It's a relief for us. But not everyone is happy about the bubble. On PEI, someone previously left this nasty note on a car with an out-of-province license plate. In spite of what you may read, you're very welcome here. So today, the Premier was out on the Confederation Bridge doing damage control in an effort to avoid any bubble trouble. There were even PEI-themed gift bags. I believe there's been some isolated incidents, of course, which I don't think has been uh, in, in line with what we normally do here in Prince Edward Island. I think uh, so much unknown has caused some fear and anxiety amongst islanders. There's been opposition in Newfoundland and Labrador, too, with nearly 15,000 signing a petition to keep the border closed. But when the doors opened today, those arriving on the first flight in were grateful. His mom passed away, so we're here for a funeral. There are currently five active cases of COVID-19 in the entire Atlantic region. So many say they support the Atlantic bubble, but don't want to open to the rest of Canada. Oh, <laughs> I hope not for a while. <laughs> Seriously, yeah. I don't feel safe. I wouldn't travel anywhere else. The Atlantic premiers say they'll wait to see how visiting neighbors goes before welcoming the country. Kayla Hounsel, CBC News, Halifax. Ontario Premier Doug Ford says he will not order beaches to close despite what has played out on those shores recently. It's common sense. You go to a, a packed beach, find another place uh, if it's jam-packed. You know, I, I, I wouldn't go to a jam-packed beach. Toronto's mayor also wants beachgoers to use common sense, not to mention physical distancing and masks. But John Tory says there are no plans to limit the number of people who can gather. Outside of wearing a mask in the clubhouse and staying away from people, um, getting ready is pretty much the same as it's always been. 31 Major League Baseball players and seven team staffers have tested positive for COVID-19. The league says it conducted 3,100 tests and a shortened MLB season is set to start on July 23rd. The All-Star Game, though, will not be going ahead this year. The 4th of July weekend in the U.S. is usually a reason to celebrate, but with COVID-19 far from under control in many parts of that country, there are calls for caution. 52,300 new cases were recorded yesterday. That breaks the single-day record set on Wednesday. Salima Shivji now on the fears this holiday weekend could bring yet another surge. In a state with infections hitting record highs, the urgency is mostly absent. Some beaches off limits for the July 4th weekend, but many others divorced from the reality of a pandemic, packed. Even in one of only two states where COVID-19 cases are on a downward trend, this is a worry. This is honestly crazy. I haven't seen it this busy yet but I find it a little bit ridiculous. With hospital beds increasingly filled in the hardest hit areas, exasperation from doctors. Put the damn mask on. <laughs> that the message isn't getting through. I think it's unconstitutional to be forcing us to wear masks. Today we're supposed to be celebrating our independence. It seems like more and more of it is being taken away from us. The resistance to toning down celebrations so fierce in some quarters, the country's top doctor Leading. Please wear a face covering. If we all wear these, we will actually have more independence and more freedom because more places we will be able to stay open. The concern that holiday gatherings will supercharge the spread of the virus, certainly not registering in the president's okay, plans. Thank you very much. We're going to Mount Rushmore. Mount Rushmore is in great shape and it's going to be in great shape uh, for centuries to come. A patriotic display in the shadow of former presidents. In friendly territory, thousands of supporters packed in. That was always the plan. We won't be social distancing. We're asking them uh, to come, be ready to celebrate, to enjoy the freedoms and the liberties that we have in this country. Free to choose to wear a mask or not. That scene will repeat here tomorrow with another fireworks display billed as one of the largest ever. In open defiance of public health advice and daily infection records that keep getting shattered. Salima Shivji, CBC News, Washington. The U.S. still has the most COVID infections, a quarter of the world's entire caseload. That total has now passed 11 million and more than 520,000 people have died 
Beyond the United States, the world's current hotspots include Brazil, Russia and India. The UK is not seeing a spike in cases, but it's not seeing a daily drop either. Still, some restrictions are being eased this weekend, including at pubs. As Renee Filipponi tells us, though, not everyone is raising a glass. Last minute preparations before Saturday's big open. Pubs across England are restocking and retooling, getting ready to pour pints in a pandemic. So this is our sign just for people when they come in, just it's pretty basic. We this pub actually... owner has been working on his reopening plan for weeks with hand sanitizer, online menus and more space. He admits making it work is tough. We want to keep everyone safe. I'm worried about the staff. I am. I think we've got every we've thought of everything, but we just don't know if, if we're packed tomorrow. We're going to have to rethink things. After months without a trip to their local, estimates are more than a third of adults plan to hit the pub in the first week. Restaurants, cinemas and hairdressers will also reopen tomorrow. Good evening. The Prime Minister is urging people to act sensibly. We're not out of the woods yet. The virus is still with us and the spike in Leicester has shown that. That city was forced back into full lockdown after a spike in COVID cases. Critics say authorities didn't act fast enough. Now that we've got the data, we can see that we should have picked it up three weeks ago. Sir David King is a former chief scientific advisor to the government. He says Johnson isn't making decisions based on science. And opening up this weekend is extremely risky. Uh, the best estimate of the number of new infections in England per day is three and a half thousand, uh, which is roughly the same number from three weeks ago. But it is also the same number that we had when we went into lockdown in March. It was a calm scene today for a royal preview in support of local businesses, trying to carefully emerge amid concerns the public will pour in tomorrow. Renee Filipponi, CBC News, London. A noose was found hanging outside a hospital operating room four years ago. Now, the Alberta government is ordering a third party investigation. What does that say to any other physician, healthcare worker, hospital housekeeper, porter in that province? Our exclusive investigation is up next. Plus, pushing the boundaries of science to find a fix. It's very exciting to see them move forward. We take you inside some of the most innovative work being done to find a coronavirus vaccine. And might Washington's NFL team finally be changing its name? We're back in two minutes. The fact that this guy is still working is appalling. In New Brunswick, Chantel Moore's mother is calling for the officer who killed her daughter to be fired. The 26-year-old Indigenous woman was shot last month during a wellness check. The officer has returned to work. He's on administrative duties. Quebec's police watchdog is investigating. In the United States, three Colorado police officers have been fired. Another resigned after these photos were made public. The officers are smiling and appear to be reenacting the chokehold that ended Elijah McLean's life. The 23-year-old black man was killed by police last summer. Alberta's health minister has ordered an investigation into an incident that happened four years ago. A white surgeon hung a noose at work and said it was for a black colleague working in the same hospital. Charles Rosnell reports. Dr. Vinan Vessels, a white South Africa-born surgeon, tied and taped this noose to an operating room door at Grand Prairie, Alberta's Queen Elizabeth II Hospital in June 2016. He told a colleague it was for a black surgical assistant. It was immediately reported to hospital administration and several more times over the next four years to various health authorities. Alberta Health Services said it investigated and took appropriate action. But sources say Vessels was never suspended, never faced any formal discipline. The fact that the incident occurred, yes, that it was uh, atrocious. But the, the, rea the, the lack of action, I think, is equally atrocious. 
Dr. Kerry Coleus reported the incident several times. She says authorities, through their inaction, effectively tolerated the egregious behavior. What does that say to any other physician, healthcare worker, hospital housekeeper, porter in that province, in the province of Alberta? It says that if you are a victim of an equal or lesser injustice, that don't bother reporting because nothing's going to happen. Alberta Health Minister Tyler Shandro says he was assured in 2019 that the incident was being dealt with. But yesterday, four years after it happened, Shandro told CBC News he is ordering a third-party investigation. In a statement, Vessel said he made a lasso, not a noose, and it was meant as a joke. At the time, I did not appreciate the heinous symbolism behind the knot I created. I am terribly sorry and embarrassed about this incident. But in a written apology in 2016, Vessels admits he tied a small roped noose. The Canadian Civil Liberties Association says this was an act of overt, violent racism that demanded a more decisive response. There is enough here to dismiss. There is a, to, for, for that person to have been fired. Uh, surely there is enough here for the police to have been called. The surgical assistant who was the target of the noose declined to speak to us because, his colleagues say, he fears losing his job. Charles Rusnell, CBC News, Edmonton. Next on The National, the latest on the hunt for a COVID-19 vaccine. As some of the most promising options are pushing the boundaries of modern science. And when we come back, your questions. Our expert, Dr. Isaac Bogosh, will be here to take a look at issues, including this one. As professional leagues, like the NHL, prepare to return to play, are there enough tests so that public supply won't be affected? It's a great question. The answer right after this. Welcome back. As scientists around the world scramble to develop a vaccine for COVID-19, some are using a new way of prompting the body to fight off infection. Christine Birak explains the breakthrough potential of gene-based vaccines. There are now 18 vaccines in human trials worldwide, including this one from Pfizer and BioNTech. It was tested on 24 healthy volunteers in the United States. Early data suggests they all developed antibodies to fight the virus. Researchers are optimistic. Those antibody levels are, are pretty high. They're actually higher than what's being seen in patients who have had COVID-19 and recovered. So, uh, so that's exciting. This drug and almost half the other front runners are gene-based vaccines. They use DNA or RNA, the genetic building blocks from the virus. Like all vaccines, they give the immune system a sneak peek at the invader. Traditional vaccines inject a weak or dead piece of it so the immune system can develop antibodies to attack it. But DNA or RNA vaccines offer instructions to your body to build a piece of the virus itself. It's like you give the message in Morse code or in a language that the cell will be able to translate. Genetic information directs your body to make a small part of the coronavirus, like those outer spikes. Once built, they can't make you sick, but they can show the immune system a piece of the enemy. DNA and RNA are newer, promising technology that is, it's, uh, in, from my perspective, it's very exciting to see them move forward. Gene vaccines can be produced relatively quickly. After all, your body is doing most of the work. But it's not clear if these vaccines will actually protect people. They have worked in dogs, but no DNA or RNA vaccine for humans has made it to market. It's early stages yet, and we're, we're in it for the long haul. And the, the important thing is that uh, the safety of these vaccines is paramount. The long haul could be months or several years, but the search for answers to this pandemic could lead to a brand new generation of vaccines. Christine Birak, CBC News, Toronto. It is time now for your COVID-19 questions. And based on what you've been sending us, the return of pro sports is clearly on your mind. So we're going to dig into some of those for you tonight with infectious diseases expert, Dr. Isaac Bogosh, he's also an advisor to the National Hockey League Players Association on player safety. So thank you for making time for us once again, Dr. Bogosh. 
Oh, not a problem. Let's get right to the questions because I want to make sure we have enough time to get to all of them. And the first one does address the issue of the return to pro sports. As professional leagues like the NHL pre prepare to return to play, are there enough tests so the public supply won't be affected? Yeah, that's a very good point. And the leagues that are starting up, uh, at least the protocols that I've seen, have really started to use private laboratories so that they don't pull tests away from the public health laboratory. So these leagues should not be taking tests away from uh, people, especially in the community to which they're functioning, because they are going to be using private labs. And uh, my understanding is that many of these labs are not even in the cities or perhaps even in the country for which the, uh, the play is going to be taking place. The second question we have looks at the issue of play overall, the play in general. Is there a reasonable way to play baseball, specifically, and stay safe? I think baseball is a great sport, especially in the context of COVID-19, and mainly because it's, it's outside. People are generally far apart from each other. And, of course, in this era, nothing is without uh, risk. There's always going to be some level of risk. But to, this is the kind of situation where people can really spread apart for the vast majority of the game. And with uh, high-contact surfaces like the ball or perhaps the bat, if people are mindful to not touch their eyes, nose, and mouth and, and, and use hand hygiene and hand sanitizers regularly, I think this could be conducted in a very safe manner. Are there sports that you're more concerned about? These are any situation, really, where people are clustering close together, especially in indoor environments, and there's, like, prolonged close contact. Those would be sports that I'd be more concerned about. But, you know, some are sports that are played outside. Of course, it's, nothing is without some element of risk, but I think the risk is going to be minimal in most of these outdoor summer sports. We've got a couple that have a more general uh, ask of you in terms of our personal safety, maybe when we go out to these games or when we're going to see friends on the weekend. Can I be in one bubble, leave and self-isolate, <laughs> then join a different bubble? That's a good one. I haven't actually seen specific outlines in the public health guidelines of the different provinces for this but it certainly would make sense if you were in one cohort of people or one bubble or however it's working in your province and you want to join a different group of people and you're able to self-isolate ideally it would be a, a, for a period of 14 days uh, then certainly you could join another bubble safely of course you have to run it by everybody in the bubble and make sure that you're uh, self-isolating for a period of time uh, but uh, I think this could be done safely. But, of course, this is group decision-making and collective decision-making, and everyone who's part of the new bubble should be informed. Based on what you've been seeing, though, in the last couple of weeks, as we become more permissive, if we can put it that way, do people understand the restrictions and what it means to be in a bubble? Uh, it's hard to know. Uh, I think it's really hard to know. And certainly, I, I'm, I'm curious, and I've been asking around and seeing what people are doing and how they're doing it. But, of, of course, that's just representative of the bubble that I'm living in. And I appreciate that there's lots of bubbles across the country. Uh, I think some people are doing a good job at this and, and really adhering to the guidelines based on the area that they're in and the province and the re restrictions that they're living under. And I, as you point out, I think others might be a little more cavalier and perhaps not. I think it's just important that you know, we really have to adhere to these public health guidelines if we want to avoid a second wave. And that includes uh, adhering to the, the protocols in your province about how many people can congregate together physical distancing, hand hygiene, and putting on a mask uh, when you're going in, into an indoor setting. Okay. And one final question for you tonight, at least, Dr. Rogosh. Have we learned anything new about people who've recovered from COVID-19? Oh, yeah, we certainly have. And, of course, there's still a lot of unanswered questions because we've only known this virus has existed for six months. So we don't really have the long, long, long-term outcomes. But fortunately, the vast majority of people that recover from this infection make a full recovery and have no lingering side effects. We're seeing a small percentage of people have lingering effects with smell and taste disturbances. Uh, most people who have that will recover by 10 days, but some people seem to have this for weeks and weeks and even months. And then there's a small cohort of people as well that seem to have decreased energy levels for a period of time, weeks after they've otherwise recovered from this infection. There's a lot of interesting studies that are now recruiting patients to really look at the long-term effects of the virus after people have recovered. So I think we're going to learn more about this in the near future. Thank you, as always, Dr. Bogash. Oh, anytime. And thank you for sending in your questions. We are going to ask you for the questions you have about COVID-19 as often as possible. Keep sending them to us. You can message us directly on Instagram at CBC The National. You can also send us an email, covid at CBC 
cbcnews.ca. We also have a special project underway here at CBC News to tell the stories of as many victims of COVID-19 as we can. It is called Lives Remembered, and tonight, Derek Carvery is remembered by his mother. Hello, my name is Linda Carvery, and I want to share some things with you about my youngest son, Derek, who passed away at the age of 37 with the coronavirus on May 3rd. Derek had cerebral palsy, and he required full care. He also was not able to communicate verbally, but he could give you the most wonderful smile, which would replace the words that he could not say. He loved the water, Derek, loved the water very much, and my husband would take him out on our boat. When we didn't take him out on the boat, I would take him out on the Halifax Dartmouth Ferry and go back and forth and just pretend we were in Jamaica. And then the opportunity came about for Nelson and I to be able to take Derek to Jamaica. It was a great stimulating period for Derek because of the sounds and the different sights and the smells. Music was very important to Derek. And at church, if a certain soloist hit a beautiful chord, he would let the whole church know how happy he was by letting out a very loud and joyful sound, which turned a few heads, but that was okay. <laughs> I'm very grateful for the time our family and friends had to spend with Derry. And I can honestly say that the joyful times outweighed the hard times. And yes, I'm heartbroken. And I'm also at peace because I know that Derek is at peace and he's being cared for in the loving arms of his Heavenly Father. And that's good enough for me. Nearly 8,700 Canadians have died after contracting COVID-19. We have gathered many of their stories online. You can find them at cbc.ca slash remembered. Facing public and financial pressure now, Washington's NFL team is agreeing to review its name. As Rafi Bujikanian explains, that is an about face from a team owner who once said it would never happen. For years, the Washington Redskins' biggest problem has been off the field. Racism is racism. You either stand up against all forms of it or you don't. The team has resisted changing its name for years, but now there are growing calls against racial injustice in North America. This is the right time to do it. And the pressure isn't just from the public, it's financial too. Yesterday, Nike pulled all Washington merchandise from its website. FedEx, the team's stadium name rights holder, demanding a change. Today, Washington announced a thorough review. Things, of course, have changed in the last couple of months. And now we're in a situation where, uh, you know, when, when money talks. There is also a debate here in Canada. For years, there have been calls for the CFL's Edmonton Eskimos to change its name. <laughs> like from Inuit throat singer Tanya Tagak. Tweeting today, change is coming from a generation that denounces systemic racism. We stand as Inuit who are outraged who are hurt. This author has we also raised the issue time after time. What we're talking about in the U.S. is how money talks. And um, I don't know how it would work here in Canada in terms of sponsorship being removed or choosing to remove themselves. CBC News reached out to a couple of the Edmonton team's biggest sponsors. Tim Hortons and Brick did not get back to us. We haven't seen the sponsors indicate that they're in any way displeased. This sports economist says the Canadian franchise may face more pressure once games here resume. You know, the CFL doesn't quite hold uh, the public imagination the way that the NFL does. And so it's kind of an out of sight, out of mind sort of thing. The team says it consulted with northern communities last year, but hasn't released that data. And now says it will ramp up engagement with Inuit communities to assess their views. Rafi Bujikan, UMCBC News, Edmonton. And tonight, another team appears to be moving in the same direction. In a statement, the Cleveland Indians baseball team says it too will review the team name. 
Well, next on the National For You, the crucial work of holding on to history. Those who worked very closely with him understand the gravity of what we lost. The legacy left behind by one Indigenous chief and the efforts to keep his memories alive. That's next. Welcome back. When Chief Kwaksistala died in 2018, it was feared a wealth of knowledge would go with him. As one of the last culturally trained clan chiefs in his community, much of his teachings were in the form of song. As David Common shows us, his wife has made it her mission to preserve that knowledge for generations to come. Okay. I don't have one of those. Okay, here we go, snap in. More than a year after Clark Sistala's death, it is both comforting and sad to hear her partner's voice. It's too soon for me to say. I'm just now coming out into public. The world still moves, but those who worked very closely with him understand the gravity of what we lost uh, last July. Quaxistella was born in 1929. At the time, his family saw danger in residential schools. And they put a plan together to seclude this young man, to conceal him, to not have him on the record. Hidden and raised in the forest, his sole role to learn and teach the oral history of his people. It's a millennia, millennia of knowledge that he knew more than just how to go and dig a clam, more than just how to go and harvest berries. His real gift has been to um, not just remind us how to dig a clam, but why, that this was ancestral. Those stories, instructions on how to live. They were to encourage children, because, you know, and I guess you'd say they were the labor force, but it was more to teach them this worldview this way of thinking, this way of harvesting, this way of respecting. The words talk about, we're going to build a clam garden for our mother Ya'a. We're going to roll the rocks and extend the beach line and make a clam garden so our mother Ya'a will be happy. But with Quaxistala's passing, the race is now on to preserve his knowledge, their history, all of it embedded in song. All of the songs were instructions, not only about what to do, but they were also inspiration, so you felt good about working so hard. In life, Quaxistala was revered because his mother had had a dream that he would grow to be a great chief, a prophecy that proved true. His grandfather said, I don't know how, but your, your words are going to fly around the world. Were it not for him, those words, that history, may have been lost. Knowledge as people now work to pass on to their future generations. David Gallman, CBC News, Vancouver. Next, we'll show you how one dog went from man's best friend to neighbor's best friend. I followed her gaze and went, oh my God, there's a, there's a fire. The moment right after this. A fire in the middle of the night destroyed this home just north of Toronto this week. The loss could have been so much worse. In that home were four people, two of them unable to get out on their own. Despite the raging fire, all of them survived. And it's all thanks to a dog living nearby, on alert, a quick thinking neighbor and police who rushed into action. That is our moment. I heard our dog Georgia uh, getting up and going out onto the landing, which was unusual for her. I thought, oh, something's up. She looked at the, the window and I followed her gaze and went, oh my God, there's a, there's a fire. And within a couple of minutes, the police had arrived. Our officers responded to a call from a concerned neighbour. 
Officers rushed inside of the burning building uh, and located four people and a family dog uh, inside the house still. The information I received was that two people were in wheelchairs, uh, so officers actually picked them up and carried them out of the home, uh, as well as uh, getting the other two and the, and the dog as well outside of the out of the home. I just I was relieved to hear that they they were fine, taken to hospital with smoke inhalation. They've lived here about 12 to 15 years. They have a really nice family. If Georgia hadn't woken me up, uh, we probably would have lost a minute or two. It's a pretty great neighbor. Tony Farr says it's the kind of street where when people move into the neighborhood, they stay. I can see why. Well, that is the National for this Friday, July 3rd. I'm Nika Kuxal. Have a great night.